Welcome to this second lecture covering the module entitled Legal Construction of the Employment Environment. Uh, during our first uh, lecture, we covered uh, the recruitment of appropriate candidate section, and now we're going to move on to our second topic, which is testing. So I'm going to go forward to slide 42 or 43, and we'll resume our lecture at that point. Uh, so here are all the recruitment topics that we covered in that first lecture. And here we have our next topic, which is testing. And this, of course, is pre-employment testing that we're going to be talking about here. So let's get started talking about employment tests. Okay, so let's consider the issue that the law is trying to confront. There definitely is an interest that employers have in hiring the best person and making sure that person isn't um, going to be stealing, isn't going to be uh, not the most qualified person, isn't going to have a substance abuse problem. And so those are the employer's issues. Am I selecting the best person and is this person that I'm selecting relatively problem free? But of course, there's other issues, and that is from the employee's perspective. There can be some privacy concerns and also some concerns about self-incrimination. Also, sometimes tests can unfairly favor one group over another. And so the uh, uh, system that we have to evaluate tests, consider both of these interests, because they're both legitimate interests, um, as it establishes a, a mechanism by which employers can test uh, applicants. So, of course, we have our first definition here. Let's spend a second talking about that definition. Pre-employment testing, I mean, it's exactly what you think it is. Testing that takes place before employment, before hiring, or after hiring, but before employment. In, con in connection with such qualities as integrity, honesty, drug and alcohol test, HIV, or other characteristics. The primary concern that we will see about this in the law is the possibility of disparate impact. Um, if I have a test that is designed, or at least it's, it's intended to predict um, uh, mathematical reasoning skills, uh, but in fact, it doesn't seem to do that completely reliably, and instead there seems to be a strong tendency for people of a certain ethnic group to perform significantly better. Let's say that 70% um, of African Americans pass the test, 95% of Caucasians pass the test. So that would tend to lead us to think that there is some kind of inherent problem with the test and that there's such a, a divergent of experiences on taking this test. Um, it may to some extent predict performance. For example, the 5% of Caucasians who don't pass probably aren't very good in math. And a significant percentage of the 7 of the 30% of African Americans who fail probably aren't the best at math either. But there seems to be at least some disconnect um, along those lines. It seems to maybe under-include some African Americans and maybe over-include some Caucasians. And that's what we will call disparate impact. The test itself, probably, the, the writers of the test had no desire to discriminate against any group. Um, so they didn't have an evil intention. They had a facially neutral policy that somehow or another inadvertently resulted in discriminating against a certain category of people. Disparate impact analysis, we've talked about that in previous uh, uh, modules. And so that's the one of the major concerns that we have with pre-employment testing. Now, pre-employment testing kind of has uh, two buckets that it can fit into. One is eligibility testing. This is when you're trying to find the best person for the job. You might give a group of people a test and you might uh, score them out. Well, you might want to offer the job to the person who scores the highest on the test because presumably or hopefully that person's going to be the best for the job. So you're trying to pick amongst people uh, sorting through and selecting the best. But it doesn't mean that the person who you don't hire, the second best or the third best, wouldn't have been very good for the job too. It doesn't mean that they're not qualified for the job, but you only have one opening, so you obviously want to pick the best. That's eligibility tests. Examples of eligibility tests could be intelligence tests, tests of physical stamina. In other words, if I can lift more weight than Bob can, well, if in a job that might be uh, maybe a, a, a 
a shipping worker, somebody who's carrying boxes to to on, get on the boxes or get on the trucks or things like that, then you even though Bob might be perfectly adequate because he's not quite as strong or doesn't have quite as much stamina as I do, I would be the better choice. Bob might be plenty intelligent. He's got an IQ about 100, about average, but maybe Sarah has an IQ of 110 doesn't mean that if Sarah turns down the job you shouldn't hire Bob but if you have a choice between Bob and Sarah and the job does require uh, high intelligence that you're probably going to want to prefer Sarah. These are tests that uh, rank people and, and uh, help you sort through who is more more attractive and less attractive for the job. Ineligibility testing is different. Here you're trying to eliminate people who just wouldn't be a good match. Uh, so for example, this could be drug testing. It's not as if you say, well, you know, you didn't have as much uh, cocaine in your system as Larry did, so we're going to hire you. No, you're saying anybody who has cocaine in his or her system, we're not going to hire. Now, the people who remain after we've gotten rid of the people who are using drugs doesn't mean that we want to hire all of those, but they are eligible to be hired. The test hasn't excluded them from eligibility. Then we might want to apply a different test to sort through the remaining population. Let's consider a situation here. So there's this business who wants to hire some laborers. So obviously laborers in this situation, the nature of the job is they need to lift a significant amount of weight. And actually one of the requirements for this job is they have to lift uh, 100 pounds routinely on the job. Bob is 5'10", and he weighs about 140 pounds. He applies for the job. Um, actually, I changed the name here. So ant builders and pink flamingo builders will say are the same business. Anyway, Bob's uh, Bob tests excuse me, the business test Bob's physical stamina to see if he is capable of doing the job. That would be eligibility test. So they might have Bob lift something that weighs 100 pounds. Um, maybe the nature of the job is that some items weighing 100 pounds have to be list, lifted 20 times um, uh, an hour. So Bob might be asked to do that 20 times in an hour. That would be an example of eligibility testing. Um, so we've talked about that to be uh, legally validated, an employer must show that an eligibility test is job related and consistent with business necessity. So imagine that you had a test. Uh, see, Bob is going to be a laborer. His job is to move boxes from an assembly line onto a truck. That's his entire job. He doesn't need to know how to do algebra to do his job successfully. That doesn't help him be more successful at his job. So a test that would require uh, Bob to do algebraic problems would not be job related and it would not be consistent with business necessity. So while that test, that algebra test might be very appropriate for other positions that that employer has, it would not be appropriate for Bob's position. And so therefore that test could not be validated. So a test is not inherently good or bad. It's how it's being used. And well, I mean, I guess some tests are inherently bad. So, but there can be lots of tests who can be good under the right circumstance that aren't good in every circumstance. So when we use the term business necessity, what do we mean? Well, it's a defense. So the, def so the, uh, uh, defendant or the uh, employer in this case would need to prove it, would bear the burden of proof. So it's a defense to a disparate impact case based upon the employer's need for the policy as a legitimate requirement for the job. Again, this is a, a job related, essentially is a different way of saying consistent with business necessity. In other words, the point is, um, ant builders need laborers who can lift 100 pounds because that's how big the boxes are. And so that's the necessity that requires it. Let's imagine for a second that laborers actually don't have to carry 100 pounds, that the biggest box that a laborer is ever going to be asked to lift is 50 pounds. So a test that requires Bob, the applicant for the job, to lift 100 pounds would not be job related or consistent with business necessity. So why do people engage in ineligibility testing? Well, the big ones are to reduce workplace injuries or to provide a safer work environment. Many times people who are either uh, abuse substances or have um, some kind of uh, a lack of strength. Let's say if, if I'm working in the shipping department and I am not very strong physically, 
then if I pick up a 100 pound box, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to hurt myself. Maybe I'm going to drop it. Maybe I'm going to wrench my back. Maybe I'm going to uh, fall over and land on, on top of somebody else. That creates an unsafe work environment for me, the employee, but also for other folks. If I am likely to be intoxicated and I'm driving a forklift, I could hit somebody else. So ineligibility testing, or when, when, when those tests aren't in place, there is an increased risk for workplace injuries. It also tends to predict employee performance. If I can't lift 100 pounds, then, and I have a job where I'm supposed to lift 100 pounds, my job performance isn't going to be good. If I'm abusing alcohol or uh, some kind of illegal substance, that's likely to impact my job. Maybe I'll come to work intoxicated, so therefore I'm not going to have my faculties about me as much, or perhaps I'm not actually intoxicated when I come to work, but I'm hungover. I'm not feeling well. I'm uh, not in a position to put forth my best effort. So those can be another category. And then, of course, this is related. This last one is related to the first one. Um, an employer has some financial responsibilities if people are injured at work. And so certainly by reducing the number of injuries, you're also reducing that financial risk for the employer. These are pretty common areas that we see employers deciding to do tests, drug tests. And when I say drug, I would also include alcohol in that category. A medical types of tests. Um, genetic tests, polygraph type tests, which are separate from pen and paper type honesty tests, and also scored tests of ability. So let's consider these very briefly. Generally, a drug and alcohol test are some of the most common tests. And unlike these other categories, except maybe for the polygraph test, these are, t and maybe sometimes medical examination tests, uh, drug tests continue throughout the employment relationship in many places. Um, uh, the, uh, there are actually some laws that require that employers engage in drug and alcohol testing. Um, there's also uh, state regulations to consider in this area. Common times to do drug testing is prior to hiring. Um, also when there's some kind of aberrant behavior, somebody seems to be staggering, one can smell alcohol in one's breath, um, they cannot be, seem to be speaking coherently, um, they say that they've taken something, um, they have uh, other symptoms, maybe dilated pupils or things along those lines. That can be a situation. This is usually called reasonable suspicion. A third is after an accident. Now, many times the accident, there's no indication that there's been any illegal drug use, but still many times, even if it's obvious that Bob didn't cause the accident, he may still have to submit to uh, some type of drug and alcohol test. And finally, many employers use random drug testing. The system really does have to be random, and it's usually a best practice not to um, have the unit itself generate the random numbers, but to have some, some group outside the unit that don't even know these names generate the numbers. And it's a good idea to include the entire population, including more senior people. Um, within the, the, the system. So those are some categories. In Texas, all these categories are legal and these are a pretty common system to have in place. Uh, some people consider a pre-hired drug test, uh, I've heard it described as a, more not so much an, of a drug test, but as an intelligence test because um, most drugs uh, don't stay in your system for very long. So if you po test positive, you weren't able to count the number of days since you last used drugs. Because so obviously, um, if, if an employer just have, has pre-employment drug testing, all the person has to do is stay clean and sober for that period of time prior to the drug test. And then they can return to using the substance as they might have otherwise. So uh, this will help a little bit, but these are probably in the long run going to be more useful. Some people will actually put up, we do drug testing signs um, at place of employment and actually don't conduct the drug tests. And the reason they do that is they want to discourage people who are going to be uh, drug or alcohol abusers from applying for the position. Because yeah, these, these drug and alcohol tests are not inexpensive and, and they can certainly interfere with productivity because the person has to leave work, go to the facility, and then um, you know there's a delay in getting the results. And so there's, there's some administrative costs and also some productivity costs associated with it. Um, 
uh, employees need to submit to the test. If they don't submit to the test, as a general rule, the employer is entitled to dismiss the employee. And that's a pretty common result. I would say more common than dismissal is to treat the refusal to submit to the test as a positive test. And many times employers do not dismiss people on the first positive test. Maybe if they actually uh, are found to um, have been intoxicated because of an accident, there might be a different approach, but there's usually some intervention that an employer will have for individuals who test positive. So if somebody refuses to be tested, they're oftentimes put into that category. About half the states have drug testing laws and they can really, really vary. I've worked a lot for, with Connecticut statute and it's a more a demanding one than what we've seen um, that what we see, for example, in Texas. Texas itself does not have any laws at this time. Of course, that could change, and you want to make sure that you're up to speed with those topics. Another thing that's important is if you have a unionized workforce is that uh, drug testing is a mandatory bargaining topic under those circumstances. So the collective bargaining agreement should address it if there is a plan to have drug testing. Um, so um, if you work for an, a governmental agency, there are some constitutional issues that can arise with drug testing. As we've said before, the Constitution deals with our relationship, yours and my relationship, with the federal and in some cases state governments. It doesn't deal with our relationships with each other or a relationship with private employers. So there aren't constitutional issues that come up routinely in private employment situations. But when we work for the government or we're applying for a job with the government, we do oftentimes have constitutional issues. And so random drug testing can arise as a Fourth Amendment violation because it can be counted as an unreasonable search and seizure. Um, but public employers generally are able to say, well, for safety sensitive jobs or when there's reasonable um, suspicion, then random drug testing can be uh, completed. And the area that we see it most commonly is going to be transportation transportation related jobs. For example, if I'm driving a semi truck um, or something along those lines, or maybe I'm dealing in industry like nuclear power plants or something like that, um, or maybe I'm in the military and I have uh, responsibilities to use weapons and things like that. Those would be areas that we would see that the, the needs of, of maintaining a safe situation are more important than uh, the constitutional dimensions to the issue. And the thing of it is, employees in those particular fields know that they are subject to that search and seizure because they understand going into that particular function that this is one of the uh, things that are gonna flow from that particular job. You don't need to know the particular procedures here. Um, if you are an HR professional who is setting up a drug testing program for your employer, you obviously will need to think through these types of, of issues. So you, you'll want to use a reference uh, manual. Probably you'll use some kind of outside company to help you set up uh, the system. Maybe the collection facility that you're going to be using will have some kind of template for you to work from. Again, more about the, the system that you may want to have or something along the lines of what you might want to have in your system. I'm not going to talk about this. The Drug Free, Drug Free Workplace Act um, does, in fact, have governmental employers, but it also has some components that relate to private employers who um, uh, uh, want to contract with the federal government. The big area where drug testing uh, bumps up against a statute is going to be the Americans with Disabilities Act. We haven't yet covered the disability statute in great detail, and I'm not gonna do it right now. I'm just gonna kinda introduce a few ideas. Generally speaking, drug and alcohol addiction is not a uh, disability if the person is actively involved in the behavior. Now, alcohol, uh, abuse is sometimes considered a disability even when the person is continuing to abuse the substance. But illegal drug use is definitely not considered a disability until the person is in rehabilitation. So um, a, 
and certainly everyone who uses drugs and everyone who uses alcohol is not an addict or doesn't have a disability associated with it. So it's a, a more complicated analysis than just saying, well, this person must be a drug addict because they have some marijuana in their system. I mean, that could be the case, but it doesn't follow automatically. So under the Americans with Disabilities Act, an employer must not fail to promote, terminate, or otherwise discriminate against an employee who has undergone treatment for a drug addiction is no longer using drugs. Now, the, the question is, well, how long does a person have to be free from drug use? I mean, imagine somebody who's uh, addicted to drugs who comes into you and says, yeah, um, I used to abuse drugs, but I'm clean and sober now. And you say, well, how long have you been clean and sober? They look at their watch and say, well, it's one o'clock now. I had my last uh, cocaine at 10 a.m. this morning, so I've been clean and sober for three hours. Certainly that person we would not consider to um, have, have been clean and sober sufficiently long. Would 30 days work? Possibly. Um, so uh, usually I would say once an employee has started treatment and has been clean and sober for some period of time, probably about 30 days, that's about the time that the employer should seriously consider that the ADA might apply to that employee situation. The fact that an employee might have a relapse doesn't mean that they suddenly are not going to necessarily be covered. Uh, they would need to be again clean and sober for some period of time after that relapse. Um, so there is no problem with the ADA prohibit, uh, uh, there's no problem under the ADA with employers who choose to have a drug test for illegal substances. Sometimes what will happen though is that, uh, let's say that you have an employee has chronic pain and so this employee takes um, some kind of opiate medication. It's a prescription medication. He or she is not abusing the medication. He or she is using it as the physician has directed and in the quantities that the physician has directed. Well, if this employee submits to the drug test, it, the opioid will show up in the system, and so there will be a positive for the drug. Test, for the drug. And so that will uh, cause the system to say, this person uh, has tested positive. For that reason, you need to have a drug testing system that will have a, a check. So what will happen is that the uh, a doctor or nurse will contact uh, somebody not within the company, somebody from the testing facility, will co contact that employee and ask the employee for any kind of prescriptions that this employee might have that could have caused the particular result that came up. Uh, the employee would have to provide documentation of the prescription and then the doc, the, uh, the physician or pharmacist or, or uh, nurse, depending upon the particular organization of that particular company, would then be able to evaluate could this prescription have caused this positive result. If it could have caused a positive result, then the uh, what, should, what would have ordinarily been a positive result will be reported to the employer as a negative result. That's a really important part of the process. There's not going to be a lot of uh, diagnoses that are going to, to follow in that area. Uh, I mean, that, that are going to cause that. Because, I mean, most prescription medication isn't going to create um, a positive on a drug screen. But, you know, if somebody's had some dental work done or um, has chronic pain, there can be a few diagnoses that does, do cause those type of problems. So you have to have that particular um, uh, test throughout the, the program. So what are some things to think about as you design your drug testing program or your alcohol testing program? Obviously, the first thing is you want to let your employees know that they are going to be subject to this type of testing. You'll want to train them in it so they will know what they need to do and how it will proceed. Uh, this is something that's a little bit uh, intimidating and a little bit distasteful, frankly, for employees. And so if they understand kind of what it's going to be like, uh, hopefully you can dispel some of the concerns that they have. And it will also likely result in them being um, inclined to um, not use drugs because they know now they're not going to be able to get away with it. So it gives them an opportunity, hopefully, to uh, resolve any issues they have. It's not unusual for employers 
employers as they roll out programs like this to give employees an opportunity to opt in to some drug testing options, I'm assuming uh, a rehabilitation options, uh, because there may be employees who say, yeah, you know, I'm going to be testing positive. I need some help to get um, this health issue resolved. As uh, the drug test samples are collected, you'll obviously want to make sure that uh, the label, I mean, that the specimens are treated appropriately with the correct labeling and the correct checks um, along those lines. Uh, many employers choose not to actually handle that process themselves, but to send the employees to professional, reliable third-party clinics. That would be my recommendation as well. And you'll absolutely want to document the chain of custody so that there can be no issue of anyone tampering with samples or samples getting confused or mislabeled or things along those lines. Obviously, we want to respect the privacy of employees. Employees aren't going to want, you know, even in a random system, you don't want to announce on the loudspeaker, Bob Smith, Mary Green, Teresa Brown, please come down to the office for, you know, random drug testing. That's not the way to handle it. You want to handle it discreetly and respectfully. Um, not only the testing process of telling people no, but the actual collection process and the way that the results are handled. So all of that's really important. Um, you're going to really tick off your workers and you possibly could have an invasion of privacy claim, a tort claim. And so you want to avoid those types of concerns when you can. And we always talked about taking into account any medications, prescription medications that the worker might have. Uh, poppy seeds in your in your uh, muffins will not cause a false positive, so don't worry about those. And of course, treat all test results, be they positive or negative, in a very confidential manner. So that's the completion of our discussion of drug tests. Let's talk about medical examinations. This is actually a defined term under the Americans Disabilities Act. And so here is the definition. A medical examination is any procedure or test that seeks information about an individual's impairments or, or health, but which tests or medical exams is not always clear. You might think, well, are those drug tests that we just talked about, do they count as medical examinations? Well, they don't, and yet you can see how if I test positive for cocaine, that certainly does give uh, me information about my impairment. It would, might intend to indicate that I have a cocaine problem. I mean, perhaps I don't have an addiction. Maybe I'm a recreational user, but it certainly does give some indication there. So uh, some things that might seem to be a medical examination like drug or alcohol testing actually have been excluded from that category. If it is a medical examination, then it is going to be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so it's important that we know which category these things fall into. Generally speaking, you cannot do medical examinations until a conditional offer of employment has been made. We've talked about this previously, so I'm going to briefly touch on this. A conditional offer of employment is when the employer extends an offer but says, we're going to hire you as long as you pass this test. And so assuming that I pass the test, I have an offer of employment. But if I don't pass the test, that offer goes poof. And so it's a way to require that the employer really be serious about um, this particular candidate before uh, they are, are going to make that candidate submit to a medical examination. Honestly, most employers are going to want to be pretty sure about a candidate before the medical examination anyway, because medical exams are not inexpensive. You're not going to put, you know, several candidates through a medical examination when you're only actually going to ultimately pick one. That doesn't make sense. So this isn't usually too big of a burden on the employer, but it does involve kind of being very uh, deliberate about it. You have to actually have that conditional offer of employment. You have to communicate it to the to the applicant. It's best to put it in writing so there can be no issues. And you'd want to make what the what the offer is conditioned on very very clear in that letter as well. Um, as a practical matter, these medical tests will be the last test performed in the hiring process. And again, it's important, you know, you send that conditional offer of, of employment and then you have the test and then you have the results and then hopefully you have the employment relationship beginning. 
So let's look at the different categories. The only one that I'm going to ask that you know about is a medical exam, is a genetic test. So um, uh, test to check for illegal drugs, not a medical exam. Test to check for alcohol, that counts as a medical exam. You might say, well, what's the difference? Well, good, good question. What is the difference? This is a, a statutory decision that the employer has, I mean, excuse me, that the, the federal government has made. Blood pressure screening. You might say, that's not really an exam. I mean, that's something you can get at the grocery store, right? Well, but it has been defined as a medical examination, probably because it tends to diagnose a condition such as high blood pressure. Um, and so, uh, other tests that are not considered medical exams are physical fitness or agility tests. Again, we don't ordinarily go to the doctor for these types of tests. The fact that I can do, you know, three push-ups and you can do seven push-ups uh, doesn't mean that I'm ill or that you are not ill. It just means that we have a different level of fitness. Similarly, polygraph tests and honesty tests don't really point to um, a medical issue. Um, psychological tests that are trying to show a range of reaction to things without getting involved in diagnoses also wouldn't be a medical exam. So, for example, the Myers-Briggs test, which, you know, identifies four characteristics, I believe, something like that, and it's kind of a, a, a system of 16 different combinations, these four characteristics. Um, that provides some interesting information. Maybe it's scientific, maybe it's not, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't say, oh, that person has bipolar disorder, that person has depression, that person is schizophrenic. Um, there are probably people who have schizophrenia who fit into all 16 of those categories, or at least many of those categories. And so because it dies, it doesn't diagnose somebody who is suffering from a disease, it's not considered a medical examination. A vision test that is going to be uh, performed by a physician is one thing that's a medical exam, but one that is performed in other circumstances isn't. So if um, I need to be able, let's say I'm a, a short order cook and I have to be able to read the uh, various items that uh, the, the uh, waiters have, have written down as orders from a particular position, then if I'm asked, you know, if it, as some kind of test, I'm, I'm asked to, to read off what I can see, that would not be a medical examination. So those are examples, but the one I'd, I'd like for you to focus on for this class is the genetic test is a medical examination. This is a neat schema. Um, I'm not going to ask you any direct questions, but this is one that I think is really can help you unpack how medical examinations work under the ADA. So as I said before, drug tests, searching for illegal substances in the blood or the urine or the hair or any other substance are not going to count as medical examinations. Um, but testing for prescription drugs to taken for medical conditions can that might be disabling is a medical exam. So let's say the employer says, well, we're going to test for lithium in people's uh, blood or urine. Well, lithium is a prescription medication for bipolar disorder. And so I don't, I don't think that uh, uh, people who don't suffer from a bipolar disorder would have lithium in their bodies. And so that could be a, an indication that this person suffers from the disability bipolar disorder. And so you wouldn't want that type of testing. Um, and so you want to be careful that the tests that you uh, perform for, for substances uh, don't uh, cause positives to result because of valid prescription medication. Now, of course, there are, uh, and when it says here drug testing for illegal substances, it doesn't have to be a substance that's always illegal. I mean, certainly we think about heroin, cocaine, marijuana, things like that. Yes, those are unlawful and those obviously can be tested for, but um, there might be something like an opioid medicine, which can be in many prescriptions, um, and so therefore are not illegal substances always, but they can uh, be lawful or unlawful depending upon the circumstances. And so that's where the um, information that the uh, employee or applicant would provide to the uh, medical officer would be able to clarify that issue.
Now this raises another point, I'll touch on it briefly. As many of us have heard, there are some states that have either decriminalized or made lawful uh, the possession or even the use of illegal substances such as marijuana. You might say, well, how does that impact drug testing? At this point, marijuana is still illegal under federal law. There hasn't been any um, of those illegal substances that have been made lawful under federal law. So even if I am in Colorado and I can lawfully, under state law, uh, use marijuana, I still am breaking the federal law by using marijuana. So an employee employer in, in uh, Colorado would be able to continue to test for marijuana. Now the employer may, might choose not to, um, either because um, of a philosophical reason or because perhaps it's so prevalent to use marijuana that you would be eliminating uh, this in an ineligibility test would eliminate so many candidates that you wouldn't be able to get the employment that you want. Um, so there could be lots of reasons why you chose not to, but it wouldn't be unlawful to exclude candidates who are using marijuana. Unless, of course, there's a state law in that area. In Colorado may have passed a state law to that effect. Um, the Americans with Disability Act provides that an employer may not make an employment decision based upon the individual's HIV status. So um, an employer shouldn't be engaging in HIV testing. Um, obviously, in the vast, vast majority of cases, there is no risk for a, um, a, an, an employee, employer's workforce for there to be an HIV-positive employee. Um, in the maybe the very few areas that there might be some small risk, um, then that should be looked at more, more carefully. So for example, maybe in a medical field or possibly uh, in the firefighting or police field where there might be some blood exchange under certain circumstances, those can be looked at more closely. But if you are running a, a run-of-the-mill type of business, there really isn't a risk um, associated with having an HIV person um, in your facility. Um, now, of course, that HIV person may have some, uh, need some accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, so it may come to light to you that you need to know about the HIV status so that you can make those accommodations, but there is no need to exclude an employee or exclude a candidate based upon HIV status. Let's consider a scenario here. So Bob, he's the HR manager, he learns that Arthur, one of the mechanics, is HIV positive. Um, shortly after that, Arthur is terminated even though his HIV didn't affect the quality of his work. He was terminated presumably because he was HIV positive. Under those circumstances, Arthur's termination is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act because he could still successfully perform his job. So we've gotten through the medical, let's me the drug test and the medical exam. So let's talk about genetic tests. Um, GINA is the federal statute that relates to this issue. At this point, we haven't seen a lot of litigation in this area. My guess is in the next 10 years or so, it will become a more common area to see activity. So, um, in addition, this is the federal law. Gene is a federal law. You also have state statutes to be aware of. We don't have any in Texas, but again, that's something that could change over time. So what, is Gina, what, what does GINA stand for? It stands for Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It forbids employers from acquiring genetic information regarding applicants and employees. Um, so um, an employer can't take a blood sample to see whether Bob is predisposed to develop uh, a Parkinson's disease, or whether Mary is predisposed to develop a type of breast cancer or something along those lines. Um, and certainly can't, if somehow or another the employer acquires that information, can't make any kind of employment decisions based upon a predisposition for those types of conditions. It's important in this area for employers not to ask for too much data from medical providers. Um, sometimes um, what might have thought to have been an innocent question of the medical provider might actually be a request that the medical provider provide information that the employer cannot have under GINA. 
So again, when um, uh, there's an issue where there needs to be some contact between the employee's physician and the employer, it's best to have either an attorney or paralegal involved in that or to have a sophisticated HR manager involved in, who can navigate uh, that area and knows exactly what can be asked, how to ask it, how to document those requests. I already talked about HIV testing, and the bottom line is employers just can't. So don't try to, don't raise that issue. Now, of course, you will hear from employees, either they, they may just share it because they are sharing people, they may share it because of uh, a need for a, a reasonable accommodation. So just because you aren't testing folks for HIV doesn't mean you won't learn about it and that you don't have the duty to keep that information confidential and that you don't have the duty to reasonably accommodate that condition. Let's talk about polygraph and honesty tests. Polygraphs are supposed to measure how honest a person is. Uh, for the most part, polygraphs are junk science. Um, many polygraphs are no better at predicting uh, truthfulness than random flip of the coin. Uh, a very skilled polygrapher can probably do better than that, but still it is very, very far from an exact science. There's a fair amount of art associated with it. And so um, my first piece of advice to you would be, uh, it's not helpful for you. It's not gonna really do anything for you. But even if somehow or another you do have that once in a, in a once in one in 10 or excellent polygrapher and, and you really are gonna get some good data, um, you really are gonna be able to find out some stuff. I would still say to you, uh-uh, don't go there. It is fraught, fraught, fraught with problems. It's almost never a good idea for an employer except possibly in situations involving um, security clearance, top secret stuff, maybe working for the government, maybe say Lockheed or, or, or an entity like that that is working for the federal government, except in those kind of unusual circumstances, it's just best for an employer to stay far, far away from polygraphs. What a polygraph is intended to do is measure things, uh, just general physiological things like rate and depth of respiration, cardiovascular activity, perspiration. And the idea is most of us don't really like to lie, but lie and are uncomfortable when we are when we do in fact lie and so we can see some differences so a polygrapher will ask some generic questions to get a baseline when in fact the answers to the questions would all be truthful and then we'll ask a question that almost everyone lies about um, you know, did you ever cheat on a test or something along those lines? And so I was able to get a baseline of how this person reacts when they actually do lie. What, how do the numbers spike up? And then you'll go into the substance. And so presumably the uh, polygrapher will be able to, to see whether um, the a person's responses are more like those initial questions, the garden variety, what's your name, what day were you born, those types of things, compared to that question that the person clearly lied about. Again, not very accurate and not very helpful for finding out the facts about the case. As a result of the unreliability of polygraphs, we have the Federal Polygraph uh, Employee Polygraph Protection Act, um, and we also have most states having some limitations on polygraph in the workplace. Texas isn't one of them, but we'll see in a second that federal law is really, really limiting, so Texas doesn't need to have one. There's really no need to have an additional statute because federal law makes uh, and private employers conducting polygraphs very, very unappealing. Okay, and the uh, Polygraph Advocates Truth Protection Act uh, provides that an employee may not discharge, um, discipline, discriminate against, or deny employment or promotion to any prospective or current employee who refuses, declines, or fails to submit to a, poly, to a lie detector test. So an employee cannot be fired for refusing to submit to it. So keep in mind, uh, you know, many employee, employers, employees who would have lied during the test are just not gonna submit. So you're not gonna really get much in the way of data. Um, 
Also, uh, this uh, statute prohibits an employer from using, accepting, referring to, or inquiring about the results of any lie detector test of any job applicant or current employee. So let's imagine for a second that you have uh, some kind of theft situation that happens in your work environment. And there's five employees who are in a position they could have stolen whatever the item is. You call the police in, the police say, listen, nah, we'd like to do lie detectors for the five workers. Um, certainly how the police want to conduct the investigation is the police's own decision. You aren't responsible for the police's decision, but what you can't do is you can't assist the police. You can't say, oh, okay, sounds great. Why don't you bring your polygrapher down to our store and you can have some office space here. No, you can't do that. Or, well, we'll, we'll, let our, we'll excuse our employees from their work. We'll keep them on the clock and let clock and let them come down and take the test. Nope, can't do that either. Or, well, tell us who did well on the test and who didn't do well. Nope, can't do that either. So um, again, the, the bottom line is that there isn't a lot that you can do. Now, there are some limitations here if there's an employee theft or other serious event. So I'm not going to say that it can never ever be used but it's pretty rare that it is um, effective or appropriate to use. And the penalties for misusing the test can be quite dramatic. Given the fact that the test results are so unreliable, it's um, not really that useful anyway, so I, I wouldn't feel too bad about not being able to use the polygraphs. So what do you do? You have five workers, you really have no idea which one of those five actually stole it. There's an easy solution. And this is going to make me sound super mean. You fire them all. I mean, that's what you do. That's how you remove the problem. Um, even though you know you're firing four people who did nothing wrong and you're also firing one guilty person, that's perfectly lawful under at-will employment. Now, if you decide, well, gosh, we'll fire three of the five, that's not going to work because presumably some of the three that you do fire are going to be of a different race or gender or ethnicity than the two that you retain. So you would need some reason to be able to distinguish the three you choose to fire from the two that you've retained. And maybe you have some kind of basis, but um, you'd, have, you'd wanna make sure that's pretty darn, careful, pretty darn carefully thought out. The best case scenario is to fire no one if you really can't limit it, or to fire them all. But you certainly don't wanna rely upon the um, polygraph results in most cases. So um, I talked about the polygraph, so you might think, well, that's just one way of measuring honesty or dishonesty. Can we use other methods? And the good news is yes, you absolutely can. There are lots of quite reliable honesty tests that you use either complete on a computer or use with pen and paper. Those are perfectly okay. I'm, I'm certain that they're not 100% foolproof, but at least those are lawful and you absolutely can use it. So let's consider this scenario here. Bob is accused of stealing some items by his boss, Jamal. Uh, Bob denies it, claiming he did not have key to, key to the case where the items were kept. Jamal asks Bob to take a polygraph, which Bob refuses. Jamal fires Bob because he refused to take the polygraph. Absolutely, Bob has a cause of action against his, his employer. Um, it doesn't matter. It could even be later on they discover that you know Bob confesses to the theft. Again, Jamal has still violated the statute. So if you ever do decide because of extraordinary circumstances that you do want to do polygraphs, you absolutely need to get an attorney who specializes in this area of the law involved to make sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Uh, one of the best ways of sorting through potential applicants is using some kind of intelligence tests um, because obviously almost all positions, the smarter, the person is the more likely they are to do a job efficiently even if it is a repetitive type job. Of course some intelligence tests don't accurately measure intelligence. Um, they may also tend to predict um, the race of the person or the gender of the person or something else. So it's hard to find the best intelligence test, but when you do and they don't tend to favor one ethnic group over another, then those can be very positive tests to use. Again, you're going to have to validate them, prove them that they prove that they are um, uh, related to the job and that they are business necessity. 
Another category of tests that we see a lot of are integrity type tests. And that goes back to that honesty idea that we were talking about earlier. Um, if you um, know that your workers are, are going to act with integrity, you are going to reduce the chances of having internal theft or other types of uh, things like that. You may even want to have pers certain personality traits in your workers. For example, if you are hiring people for a sales position and the nature of the sales is going to require that people be um, pretty aggressive in terms of, of continuing to prompt this customer to be interested in the product, uh, that requires a certain type of person. There's lots of people that would not be good at that, would not, even if they were good at it, they would find it very uncomfortable and likely wouldn't stay in the job for very long. So it is appropriate for employers to consider, again, if it is job related and there is a business necessity, to look for those particular characteristics in the position. And again, it could be physical ability or agility tests as well. Those would be appropriate. Let's consider scores tests, scored tests of ability. And again, these are designed to, to measure things like intelligence, aptitude, specific skills like, let's say you were hiring cashiers to see if they can make change. Um, Job-related act attitudes to see if people uh, think coming to work on time is really important or dressing neatly is really important, those types of things. Um, in this situation, these would be eligibility tests you would be uh, sorting through the population and trying to get people with the highest score, but it wouldn't mean that the second highest score, scoring person or the third highest scoring person is ineligible. They just weren't such a strong candidate as the other candidates were. And as we said before, some of these tests don't truly measure what they claim to measure. They also have some cultural um, circumstances. For example, imagine intelligence tests that uses vocabulary terms that are more frequently used in a particular uh, socioeconomic level. Uh, well, people in that socioeconomic level might perform much better on the test than people in a different socioeconomic level uh, because the people in the different socioeconomic level either aren't as familiar with the term or maybe they use that term in a different way. And so therefore, they might be more inclined to miss those questions, not because they lack the intelligence, but because they come from a different socioeconomic class. Tests obviously need to be examined to see if they um, tend to relate to or predict um, the characteristics. So for example, if you see, well, people of this uh, race or this ethnicity don't as a group perform as well on it as people from a different group, then that would be a sign that there could be disparate impact. And of course, if you see uh, significant evidence of disparate impact, that probably means that test is not one that you want to continue using. We've already talked about the four-fifths rule in previous lectures, but let me just give you a little bit of a reminder about this. This is an EEOC rule. It's not in the statute, and courts have not always adopted it, but the EEOC, the, the governmental agency that administers Title VII and the Americans with Disabilities Act, has this rule that says that once the, the four-fifths rule says that there is a presumption of discrimination. It's not irrebuttable presumption, but it's still a presumption of discrimination where the selection rate for any employment decision for the protected class is less than 80%, of course 80% is four-fifths, of the selection rate of the non-minority group. So again, we'd be looking at the non-minority group being men or being uh, Caucasians. And the uh, protected group would typically be women or a racial or ethnic minority such as Hispanics or African Americans or Asians, something along those lines. So here's a little clarification. If the selection rate, the percentage of, of applicants who pass the test and continue to be considered, so they don't actually have to be selected for the job, but they at least pass this initial hurdle. So if the selection rate of one protected class is less than 80% of the selection rate for the other class, then that's evidence of discriminatory effect. So let's imagine that 100% um, of men uh, pass this test and only 75% of women pass this test. Well, that would mean that the selection rate is less than 80% uh, for, for women. And so that would be 
presumed to be evidence of discriminatory effect. It's a rebuttable presumption, but still a presumption. Now, of course, no selection test is going to select 100% of any group, so you'd more likely have maybe 90% of men are selected, and then maybe you'd have 65% of men or women or something along those lines. This test has been pretty roundly criticized because it doesn't consider the sample size. 80% um, difference when the sample size is very small may not be statistically significant. 80% or 90 or 95% can be statistically significant when the sample size is relatively small, big. And so therefore this test, you really need more information about the test before you can draw any kind of conclusion about the data. It's a rule of thumb. And so it's not something that, that the EOC is saying every single time where you have four-fifths, it proves discrimination. And as I said before, when the number of applicants is very small, the four-fifths rule really isn't meaningful at all. So when you have a test that tends to uh, favor men or favor Caucasians, it's a test that tends to have a discriminatory impact it can still be defended if you show that it's job related. In other words, it's testing something that is really needed for the job and it's consistent with business necessity. Um, and this means, of course, that not just that this test works, but that there isn't another test out there that would work as effectively. So we, ha so we need to make sure that the test is valid. That's really what we're going to, to be looking at. Um, when we have questions about maybe the discriminatory impact, if we can show that it is a valid test, then we're probably going to be permitted to use it even if it's got some statistics that aren't too palatable for us. And we have three types of validation that we need to consider. Content, criterion, and construct. Those are kind of <laughs> easy to get confused with each other, but you are responsible for being able to distinguish the three. So let's get started talking about these three categories here. Okay, let's first of all consider the, what do we mean when we talk about validation? We use that in everyday conversation. You know, I feel validated when da 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 happens. Well, it means the same thing, really. Validation is evidence that shows that a test evaluates precisely what it claims to evaluate. It's a valid test. Let's say that my employer is concerned that um, it, it wants to uh, test applicants to see if they use drugs. So they have decided to uh, measure the heights of all candidates. Because their idea is the shorter the person is, the more likely it is that they use drugs. Well, the test itself, to measure the height of people is likely to be very accurate. I mean, it's not very difficult to see how tall somebody is. And so in that sense, the test is very accurate, but it's not at all accurate at measuring what the employer thinks it's going to measure because it doesn't evaluate drug use, it just evaluates height. And so that test would not be valid for the purpose that's being used for, but it could be perfectly valid for another purpose. Let's say, um, it is a absolute job requirement that somebody be at least five foot five because of some safety issue. Um, well, then a test that measures the height very likely would be a very valid process and that there would be validation of those circumstances, even though there would be a disparate impact for women and maybe some minority groups. So let's consider this first type of validation, content validation. A test has content validation if it requires the performance of the same behaviors and skills as the job in question. So what you need to do here is you need to analyze a job. You're hiring for the secretary position that's open. So you'd want to figure out, well, what does somebody in this role do every day? And you might find out, well, this, the, the incumbent types 70% of the day files 20% of the day, and answers the phone 10% of the day, okay? So you'd want to test the typing ability. You'd want to test the speed and the accuracy, for example. So it makes sense to have a word processing test for that job. You wouldn't, though, for this particular job, need to do a math test because there wasn't, there was none of the tasks that we are assigning for this particular secretary involved the computation of math. Now, there might be another secretarial job somewhere that has a lot of emphasis upon math. 
And so obviously a secret, uh, the term secretary job does not necessarily mean that these particular tests are always appropriate and these other tests are never appropriate. I'm sure there are secretaries out there who don't do any typing and there are secretaries who type virtually all the time. So you have to actually identify what this particular job requires. And then you offer a test that tests that particular conduct. And of course, in the best case scenario, you'd wanna have the test uh, involve the same work products. For example, let's say this secretary uh, position would involve typing letters. Well, guess what your word processing test ought to be? Typing letters. Or maybe the secretary is going to be typing reports. Well, guess what? Then he or she, the candidate, ought to be typing up uh, those reports. Let's say this is going to be a secretary to a doctor or to a scientist. Well, there might be very long uh, scientific terms um, that would be not very intuitive about how to spell them and Word and Microsoft Word isn't going to tell you how to spell them. Well, you might want to include some of those words in the test to test for accuracy. So those would be some content validity issues. So that's the first category here. Let's go on and talk about, well, actually we're gonna to flip to construct validity and talk about that. What is construct validity? Well, let's look at the definition. It's an approach that is generally more useful when an employer is seeking to measure a psychological characteristic, such as reasoning ability, psychological characteristic, personality characteristics, such as introvertism or extrovertism and leadership behaviors. So let's say, again, you have a sales position. The salesperson needs to uh, be comfortable going out and approaching people um, who maybe don't really want to be approached. Well, then you might want somebody who's very, very much towards the extremes and in extrovertism. And so you'd want to have tests that measure that. You might not actually, the test itself might not actually involve having that person approach strangers and ask them questions. There might be some other mechanism that you do that. It might be a paper and pencil test, but it's designed to test that particular characteristic. One thing to keep in mind when whatever type of test you're using is that there are many, many jobs that um, are easy to master. And so having a test that is saying, well, does this person already know how to do this is usually not a very useful thing. So let's say that um, um, uh, there's a receptionist position and the receptionist will need to operate a phone system. Well, it may be that to learn how to operate the phone system takes two or three hours. Um, if a person is going to be a full-time employee of this company indefinitely, a two-hour investment is kind of nothing, right? I mean, in the scheme of things, that's pretty irrelevant. So uh, saying, well, we only want to hire people who are already well-trained in the job, so we want to do a content validity test that ask them questions about which button do you hit to forward the call? Which button do you hit to transfer the call? Which button do you hit to send it over to voicemail? Or whatever the things are. Um, that's probably not that useful because even though somebody who's never used a system before is gonna miss a lot of those questions, after the two hours of training, they'll know what to do. And so there's really no need to uh, validate those particular skills. Now, of course, it's a more involved skill, for example, um, typing that requires a lot more than two hours to learn how to type appropriately, that would make a good content validity activity. Okay, so now we've talked about content validity and construct validity. I'm guessing you know what's coming up next, right? Uh, criterion validity. Okay, this is where the employer collects data related to job performance from a simulated exercise or on-the-job measures of performance. Criterion validation requires a demonstrated statistical association between performance on a job and per performance on a test and performance on a job. Um, this is um, a more challenging test to create. It requires a lot more number crunching um, and uh, usually people who choose to establish criterion based tests have a, um, a, 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 a an attorney involved and a statistician sometimes involved. And I can think of times where I have been involved in criterion testing. The one I can think of is that um, yeah, uh, 
we had a position that we had many, many incumbents for. And we had the supervisors for these individuals rate them um, on a continuum. Best, you know, really good, eh, fine, but not great shakes, and subpar, not, not really very, very good at all. And then we had these people in this position uh, take a series of tests. And so we tried to figure out, well, which questions predicted who was going to be a really good performer, who was going to be a middle of the road performer, and who was going to be not so good of a performer. And sometimes it was surprising. Some questions that we thought would be very predictive didn't end up being predictive at all. And some questions that maybe we didn't think would be that predictive actually ended up being predictive. And so that would be an example of criterion validation. A Title VII does produce the use of employment eligibility tests, and all these, of course, are employment eligibility tests. Um, they don't kick out anybody. So, for example, going back to the typing test, um, you know, it's possible that the employer would have a cutoff and saying, we aren't going to consider anyone who types below 40 words a minute. Uh, but more often, they would probably say, well, let's see who we get. Obviously, the faster and more accurate the typist is, the stronger that that person is going to be in that characteristic. But we might also care about some other characteristics. A slower typist who is also very good at filing um, might be the better candidate. Or a secretary who isn't, very, who isn't as fast with typing but has very good interpersonal skills might be the better candidate. And so um, we usually think about these types of tests as being eligibility tests versus ineligibility tests. Okay, so the, the Title VII permits these eligibility tests presuming that they have been professionally developed and validated and that the, the, the real reason isn't to discriminate. So they need to be job related and consistent with business necessity. We already saw this before, so we're just kind of repeating what we've already um, known. No, we saw that slide at one point. We're not going to find it here. Okay, well, but anyway, take my word for it. We saw that before. Those two qualifications we need for. Um, although it's not required by law, is wise for an employer to establish validity before using a test. So what you don't want to use is use the test, then you get challenged for it, and then as you're going to trial, you're trying to prove, oh yes, it actually does what we say it's going to do. It's not a requirement that you do it beforehand, but if you um, do it beforehand, then you know where you, how, if you're vulnerable and you can decide, oh, oh, I guess this test isn't really what we want to use, um, or it's got some problems, but we're so pleased with what we think it's doing for us that we're going to continue to use it, even though we know it's problematic. If you wait to test after, um, you, you can't know what the problems are going to be with the validation process. So that's a risky move to make. You may save a bit of money, but you're not going to help yourself probably as much as you think you want to. Okay. Um, We've talked about tests that sometimes, and many times, unfortunately, these tests do tend to result in certain ethnic groups and racial groups scoring statistically lower than Caucasians do. Um, even though looking at the test, it's not obvious, at least to a layperson, why that's necessarily happening. One approach that employers sometimes use, the Ritchie case is an example of that. We'll talk about that um, either, I'm not sure if it's in this chapter or another chapter. Um, an employer might be tempted to say, well, we'll have different cutoffs. We'll have this cutoff for this racial group, this uh, higher cutoff for another racial group, a different cutoff for another group. Um, 
that uh, the Congress decided was unlawful to what have what's called race norming or to have different cutoffs for different groups. Um, in 1991, the Civil Rights Act of 1991 was passed and it made those unlawful behaviors. So an employer who sees that a test tends to uh, result in lower scores from certain groups uh, can choose not to use the test, but if he uses the, if the employer uses the test, there, they has to use the one cutoff for all incumbents to that particular position. It is though an option for the employer to band test scores, to have a range. Many times the test results will tend to cluster in certain areas. And so you might say, well, all the workers who score between 82 and 86 were gonna treat the same. It might be that the one who got an 82 has more years of service than the one who got an 86. And so we're, we're going to not give the 86 preference over the 82, we'll allow uh, we'll treat these individuals in this range all the same and will then uh, be the tiebreaker some other characteristic. So that's certainly an option that employers have. It's best, of course, to establish all of this long before you have uh, the, the first people taking the test. So your banding can appear to be favoring a particular group. Okay, so one thing we haven't talked about really very much is accommodating through the testing process. We've talked about how a test uh, can't, uh, especially if it's a drug-related test, uh, can't uh, disadvantage people who take prescription medication because of a disability. But sometimes a disabled person might need some assistance in completing a test. We'll talk about the Stutz case in a second, but let's think about it in a, in a different mechanism. Let's say that you had a, uh, a blind applicant who is being hired to do a job that doesn't require necessarily vision, uh, but the test that is supposed to sort through the employee's, uh, maybe it's an eligibility test, uh, is a paper and pencil test. So the, the candidate, even though he or she can do the job, isn't gonna be able to take the test that establishes whether he or she can do the job. And so the question is, how are you going to accommodate that person? And a sensible way of doing that would be to have someone read the test questions or to have it rewritten in Braille, for example, or to have some kind of maybe computer voice uh, uh, read the, the thing. So those are some all, all opportunities that you can use to accommodate that disabled person in the testing process. Um, but there is that legal obligation to accommodate under the Americans with Disabilities Act even during the application process. The reality is that some disabilities are very obvious. For example, someone in a wheelchair or somebody who's missing a limb, uh, somebody who has a hearing or vision disability, oftentimes it's, it's pretty obvious as you're interacting with them and asking them to write things or to respond to questions. But other disabilities can be uh, more hidden. And an example of one that we're gonna talk about is dyslexia. Dyslexia is uh, an unexplained difficulty that somebody has with reading at a normal rate and in a normal method. When I say unexplained, what I mean by that is that some people, for example, I can't read Japanese. So I, uh, but that's because I don't speak Japanese and no one has ever taught me how to read Japanese. It's not because of some uh, difficulty I have with Japanese characters that's inherent. I also can't do that with um, Hindi and I can't do that with Italian. I probably could pick out a few words because they're going to be similar to French and Spanish and English, but um, I wouldn't be able to get too far in many of those languages. But I don't have a disability, it's just a lack of knowledge. Um, if I'm blind and you put a book in front of me, I'm not going to be able to read the book. But again, that mean, the, the reason is explained. I'm blind. Um, if I have um, a, a limitation of intellect, perhaps I have Down syndrome and perhaps a, a rather severe manifestation of that condition. And so I haven't been able to learn to read because of my intellectual limitations. That's an explained reason why I'm dyslexic or excuse me, why I can't read, so therefore I'm not dyslexic. Uh, dyslexic individuals don't have any of those things, and yet they still face hurdles in learning to read. 
or being able to read it at a normal rate in a normal method. So now we're up to the Stutz case. This is actually not a U.S. Supreme Court case, but the um, facts of this case, I think, are a good example of how courts are likely to interpret um, this type of disability. And I'm using it because it is a hidden disability. When uh, Mr. Stutz applies for the job, he doesn't seem different from anyone else. He seems of normal intellect, normal vision, normal hearing. There doesn't seem to be any reason why he can't do a fine job on whatever test that he's given. So he applies to enter a, a, an apprenticeship program to become a heavy equipment operator. He takes a test, the General Aptitude Test Battery, and he it receives a low on that test. He suffers from dyslexia, and it is his opinion that he scored low because of his dyslexia, that he doesn't ordinarily have a low intelligence. Well, the court held that the agency that did this test used a test that does not accurately reflect the abilities of this particular individual, Mr. Stutz, because it didn't accommodate him. Um, it might be that the way to accommodate Mr. Stutz would be to give him additional time to take the test or to uh, have someone read him the test. Those might be examples of ways to accommodate. So uh, you have to be open and listening to what the applicant says when you are providing testing mechanisms. You don't have to ask people, well, are you dyslexic or something like that. When it's a quote unquote hidden disability, it falls on the applicant to raise that issue. But again, if somebody's in a wheelchair or somebody is missing a limb, then you know they don't have to volunteer. Oh, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, I don't have a, a left arm. Under the circumstances, that would be obvious. And so you don't, the, the applicant doesn't have to volunteer under those circumstances. So at this point, we've covered drug testing, medical examinations, um, genetic tests, polygraph tests and honesty tests, and score tests of ability. And now we've completed, in our first lecture, we covered the recruitment of appropriate candidates, and now we've covered the testing process, the pre-employment testing process. In our next lecture, we'll discuss hiring. Well, thank you for your attention. Um, I uh, remind you, as always, if you have questions, feel free to email them to me or to come by my office hours, and we can talk about them at length. I appreciate your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.